It's such a pleasure to be here in Helena. Um, I have to thank a couple of people before I get started. First, my friend Molly Holtz, who's the editor of publications here at the Society. I think she's on her way to Shanghai. Um, so I, we should all be a little jealous, maybe. Um, but she was the initial contact person um, and helped bring me out here. But she handed me off very quickly to Kirby. And I want to thank Kirby for being such a pleasure to work with. He made everything so easy. And of course, everybody here at the Montana Historical Society does a great job. Um, I want to thank them for hosting me tonight. And I haven't been here since I was doing research for the book, so it's really exciting for me to be back. And of course, I'm excited to see all of you. Um, my plan for this evening is to talk a little bit about my new book, Insurgent Democracy, as well as how the book came to be. I'll connect the stories it tells to the life of people in Montana in the 19-teens and 1920s, and maybe, just maybe, try to connect it to the, our world today. I've been interested in the history of the northern grasslands for a long time, as you heard. I grew up in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, but I have family roots in rural North Dakota, and they go deep. As I like to say, I have people in the ground in North Dakota. <laughs> and because of that, I had always heard about the Nonpartisan League, or the NPL. But what did I really know about it, even though I was trained as a historian? Well, I knew that it was a movement that was made up of farmers. I, I knew that it had been quite active in North Dakota, but also in Minnesota in the 19-teens. I knew that it was controversial, especially during World War I. I knew that in North Dakota, where the Nonpartisan League took power in 1916, 100 years ago this coming November, these farmers created a state-run bank, a state-run grain elevator, and a state-run flour mill, all three of which are still in operation and, in fact, are thriving. And finally, I knew that the Nonpartisan League was one half of what became, in the 1920s, Minnesota's Farmer Labor Party, an important third party that later merged with the Democratic Party of Minnesota under the guidance of a politician named Hubert H. Humphrey, then a mayor of Minneapolis. In other words, based on what I knew, I thought this was basically a story that was rooted only in the upper Midwest. Here are all the things I didn't know and learned over the course of the eight years I worked on the book. I learned that the Nonpartisan League was likely the most successful agrarian movement in American history. I learned that the Nonpartisan League was likely the biggest challenge to party politics as usual in American history. I learned that the League's experiment with state-owned industries proved to be a one-of-a-kind affair that nonetheless continues to be cited as a potential model for other states. I learned that the Nonpartisan League story itself transcended Minnesota and North Dakota. In fact, the Nonpartisan League spread to 13 different states. And it was a powerful force for change here in Montana, as well as in other states in the Pacific Northwest. The NPL also took hold in Alberta and Saskatchewan, making it probably the only transnational political movement in North American history. And finally, I learned that the Nonpartisan League invented new strategies and new tactics for electoral politics that I argue continue to be overlooked today. So the question then is, how did I get from there to here? Well, in 2007 and 2008, I was working closely with leaders in student government at my home institution, Augsburg College in Minneapolis. And these students really wanted to do something about climate change. Um, but within a few weeks of trying to advise them as they were thinking about how to get the college to be more responsive to do something about climate change, I realized that we kind of already knew about climate change. We, we knew what it would do. We knew how it would transform the planet. But what I knew very little about, and therefore could do very little to help the students with, was the actual means by which regular people like you and I create political change, change that could transform our institution in this particular case, but also the change that could transform our communities, or even create change at the state and federal level. So although the subject of this new book and climate change seem to have little to do with each other, in fact, I came to study this democratic movement through my own honest queries about how to bring people together for change when political systems and political institutions fail us. Now this turned me away from my training in social and environmental history and towards political history, which I had never really done before. But I forged ahead because I started to realize that my work as a teacher and my work as a scholar took place in a context that transcended 
my home institution, or even my profession. I was not only a teacher and a scholar. I needed to imagine myself as having a stake in the world more broadly. And I had to commit my work as an educator and as an intellectual to changing it. I realized that I needed to conceive of myself and my vocation as connected to others, not through service, but through empowerment. I realized that I needed to envision my scholarly work as something that could contribute to a broader conversation about social and political change in our society. And of course, I had to do all this without losing sight of scholarly and professional norms and methods. In other words, I came to realize that as a historian, I needed to have a much better sense of how we, as regular citizens, might transform our world when politics and politicians seem more of an impediment than a help. After all, even the most cursory perusal of a daily newspaper or a few snippets of CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or taking a quick look at the ever-multiplying news websites that one can find on the internet all these things show us that lobbyists wield inordinate power. Office holders often seem to be distant and corrupt. Corporations command votes. Bureaucrats ignore lived realities. And citizens, you and I, remain firmly cynical. Pressing problems, including climate change, poverty, mass incarceration, endless war, and discrimination, these things pervade our lives. Our political system seems poorly equipped to do much about them. But it turns out, it turns out that we are not the first to face a failed political machinery. In the early 20th century, farmer discontent in North Dakota grew despite rising prices for the wheat that they cultivated. The brutal Northern Plains environment made eking a living out of the land difficult. Credit ran short. Local banks gouged farmers with exorbitant interest rates on mortgages. Minneapolis-based milling companies controlled commodity prices and railroad shipping rates. Those same Minneapolis-based corporations exerted undue political influence in Bismarck, the state capital of North Dakota. And so in 1915, a little over 100 years ago, these agrarians responded to their plight by creating the starkest challenge to party politics ever seen in the United States. In an effort to empower citizens, the League drove a brief but powerful electoral insurgency. And at its peak in 1920, the Nonpartisan League sported almost 250,000 paying members across those 13 states. And as a result, the NPL dramatically shaped North American politics in the late teens and early 1920s. Despite the significance of the Nonpartisan League, most today know little about its rise and fall. I think that's especially true here in Montana, despite its significance at the time. The few who do remember it, I fear, are like I was when I started working on this book. They think of it as a radical, if doomed, recapitulation of earlier forms of agrarian populist politics, largely limited to the upper Midwest. But viewing the NPL as an outdated, transitory, and local agrarian reaction to specific economic relationships misreads the movement's history. It also obscures the persistent potential of the League's perspective and tactics. In fact, the NPL used the then new tools of direct democracy to insist on a moral economy premised on accumulation without concentration. It was premised on accumulation without concentration. The League itself grew out of cooperative movements, cooperative movements that were rooted in North Dakota and South Dakota and Minnesota and Eastern Montana. And the League insisted that government could establish state-run competition in various economic sectors. The League pushed for publicly owned enterprises to compete with private corporations and to bring equity to the marketplace. Convinced that markets were the beating heart of the Republican experiment NPL members nonetheless insisted on state-imposed market fairness. In their mind, the health of the nation's political democracy depended entirely on what leaguers often referred to as, quote, economic democracy, end quote. 
And in their mind, that meant an equal chance to succeed in a market, one that drew from interdependence to foster self-sufficiency. These commitments seem strange to us today. They don't fit on the standard political spectrum, the one that we're used to using as we think about and talk about politics in the United States. Small property holders, anxious to use government to create a more equitable form of capitalism, they can't be easily categorized in our contemporary political terms. They're membership-based, non-party, cooperative movement to protect private property from corporate inroads defies easy definition. Yet the League embodied an older, alternative political economy, even as it embraced modern culture. The League reminded Americans that corporate capitalism was not the only way forward. And most importantly, the Nonpartisan League showed that the health of our democracy depends greatly on the specific economic relations that we share. In a time when talking heads typically ignore moral economy in their economic analysis, the NPL's perspective deserves our attention. Now, it was a nonpartisan stance that proved to be the League's most original and innovative tactic. Sidestepping deep-rooted political parties allowed the NPL to offer those without electoral influence a chance to shape their society. As a candidate-endorsing political organization, the NPL took advantage of the newly created direct and open primary to bypass entrenched politicians. They simply backed anyone who supported the League's program, regardless of party. The bold denunciation of parties, which of course were then and still are today a basic premise of modern politics, raised the ire of politicians everywhere. It proved to be maybe one of the most important developments in an era that already saw a wide variety of innovative democratic reform. But firmly committed to their affiliations, office holders envisioned the NPL as a powerful threat. Nonpartisanship offered a way for citizens to directly fashion governance, replacing the mediating force of a political party with a self-organized polity. These farmers invented an effective alternative to politics as usual. The rejection of parties appealed to farmers in Canada as well. Inroads in Saskatchewan and Alberta showed that the NPL's methods and ideology had a transnational reach. Now, despite the League's patriotism in the late 19-teens and during U.S. involvement in World War I, which was publicly appreciated by President Woodrow Wilson's administration, home front paranoia during World War I created an opportunity for opponents to strike back. Here, for instance, you see a farmer on the right from Rock County, Minnesota. That's a county in the far southwestern corner, right on the South Dakota border. He was tarred and feathered by an angry mob when he refused to renounce his NPL membership in 1918. And his story was one of many. In places like Minnesota, Nebraska, and Montana, vigilante groups and leading citizens alike threw organizers in jail, threatened violence, or simply ran them out of town. Yet the NPL survived. And in fact, counterintuitively in many places, it became stronger than ever. By 1920, observers across the United States speculated that the League would soon transform the national political landscape, envisioning government not as big or as small, but instead as the means to express the people's will, they sought to restore equity to an unfair economy. And in 1919, their successful establishment of a state-owned bank, flour mill, and grain elevator in North Dakota suggested the changes to come. But internal dissent caused fissures. Rival organizations and political opponents challenged or even co-opted the NPL and its platform. In state after state, including Montana, politicians from established parties tried to change and often succeeded in changing the open primary laws in order to force the Nonpartisan League to become a more traditional and thus more easily defeated third party. Agricultural depression further weakened the League by ensuring that farmers in the wheat growing regions of the northern grasslands became too poor to pay their membership dues. And in 1923, the League's national office in Minneapolis closed. <clears throat> 
Even so, the NPL created an anti-monopolist popular politics for a rapidly urbanizing America. It deployed the lessons of cooperation in political venues. It generated new tactics for electoral success within the existing political system. It exemplified the push for democratic innovation during the progressive era. It established path-breaking state-owned enterprises like the State Bank of North Dakota, the only one of its kind in the United States. This is the modern incarnation of it on the west side of Bismarck. P.S. If you're a college student in North Dakota, you have access to incredible low-interest loans because of the state bank. The bank is meant to serve the citizens of the state. The Nonpartisan League did not only establish these state-owned enterprises, it encouraged rural women to become deeply involved in electoral politics in new ways. It brought together agrarians and laborers into powerful third parties. It provided the electoral base for popular and exciting politicians like Louise McKinney, who charted out a new path. It also, before it disappeared, provided the electoral base for popular-minded US senators from a wide range of rural states who influenced federal policy in that body until World War II. And finally, the League proposed an alternate future for American capitalism. By illustrating exactly how citizens could compel government to meet their needs rather than serve corporations, farmers in the NPL clearly left their mark. In the end, as with any movement for change, controversy dogged the NPL. Its leadership often fell short. Its experiments sometimes missed the mark. Careful analysis shows that this movement for democracy wasn't always a democratic movement. Indeed, that proved to be an important factor, I argue, in its downfall. Its history lays out the clear limits of people-centered politics in a corporate age. Nonetheless, that history also points to largely forgotten possibilities. Inventive citizens grappled with established powers and challenged the status quo. Drawing on their own rather limited resources, these farmers seized the opportunity to remake their own lives. They transcended cynicism to create enduring, if regularly ignored, legacies that hold the potential to reshape politics today. And I believe strongly that we ignore this history at our own peril. Whew, okay, well, that's, that's a lot. Got kind of heavy there for a second, sorry about that. Um, the question that is probably on your minds right now is, what does all of this have to do with Montana? Well, let's get into that. A few folks here tonight might know that for many years, parts of northeastern Montana were nicknamed the Red Corner because of the strong communist presence there in the late 1920s and 1930s. But that may be where some of your knowledge starts to end. The hard times of the 1920s and 1930s not only drove many of Montana's grain farmers from the land, but also made it easy for residents to forget their sizable role, that is, the League's sizable role, in the state's politics during the 19-teens and early 1920s. But like farmers in North Dakota, and like farmers in Minnesota, and like farmers in South Dakota, newly arrived agrarians in eastern Montana or the Yellowstone Valley, and on the High Line, faced an uphill battle for prosperity. They were growing wheat that ultimately was sold on the grain market in Minneapolis, and that meant that they, too, were caught up in this system that took advantage of them through problematic grain grading, and transportation costs. And so Montana's farmers began organizing themselves. By 1916, 6,000 farmers across the state claimed membership in the Montana Society of Equity, which mimicked similar cooperative organizations in neighboring states. P.S., they were all named Equity. Once again, the, the key piece of the worldview here is this notion of an equitable chance in the marketplace. It's not an accident that that word equity keeps popping up. Their orientation towards a government-aided, centralized plan for public grain elevators and public grain terminals ensured that equity members in Montana joined the NPL in droves when the League began organizing in eastern Montana in the summer of 1916. Interestingly, the rapid spread of the League initially exacerbated tensions between Montana's farmers and their own organizations. Though the state's small farmers union backed the NPL, a few 
cooperative leaders, equity-backed legislators, people who won office and came here to Helena in November 1916, continued to resist the siren song of the nonpartisan league, though many of their constituents were clamoring for them to support it. Furthermore, Montana Agricultural College Extension Director F.S. Cooley defended the two-party system that the league so fiercely challenged. But as one NPL paper reported in December of 1916, once Montana's equity leaders, quote, got a little more experience in the legislature, end quote, they, quote, changed their attitude, end quote, and joined the NPL. By early 1917, all of Montana's farmer organizations formally approved the plans, purposes, and program of the NPL with one caveat, quote, the funds collected in Montana are to be spent in Montana under the direction of Montana men, end quote. Now, in an effort to make sense of the League's popularity with Montana's farmers, University of Montana professor Louis Levine, who in 1919 would be removed from his post at the university for critiquing the Anaconda Company, interviewed the NPL's leader, a man named Arthur Townley, as well as other leading leaguers, and he interviewed them for the New York Times. As the League was bursting onto the national scene, Levine told readers of the Times that, quote, its leadership has been recruited from all the reform elements of the country, making for a composite movement in which no one single theory dominates." End quote. Indeed, the professor observed that the NPL was, quote, animated by a spirit of compromise, end quote, one that produced a, quote, lesser regard for theory, end quote, than most political insurgencies. The good professor further noted that the League was not driven, quote, by abstract justice or a comprehensive radical program, end quote. Instead, it looked to, quote, utilize the sentiment and ideas which have already penetrated the hearts and minds of the people, end quote. <coughs> the leader of the Nonpartisan League, Arthur Townley, knew that outside the rural West and rural Midwest, farmers made up only one collective interest in politics. And Townley told Levine, that the League hoped, quote, for cooperation in politics between all organized forces of reform, end quote, on a national scale. Aspiring to become the primary organization representing farmers in American politics, the Nonpartisan League, in Townley's mind at least, could then, quote, hold counsel with other organized groups of the country and formulate a platform acceptable to all. The idea is that of a combination in which all elements remain independent insofar as they pursue different interests but combined for common purposes, end quote. And in Townley's own words, this meant, quote, total indifference to partisan politics and all that has ever gone with it, end quote. The University of Montana professor, following up on this interview, noted, and I would say was one of the only journalists to really accurately understand what the League was up to, um, Levine reported that this plan was, quote, the extension of the cooperative principle, end quote the notion of cooperation, so central to the self-conception of lower middle class agrarians on the northern grasslands. It was the extension of that principle, quote, from economics to politics, end quote. Now, this cooperative challenge to traditional parties spawned powerful enemies here in Montana. Responding to America's entry into World War I, Governor Sam Stewart established the State Council of Defense in April 1917. Staffed by leading businessmen, at first it remained mostly powerless. Most of the council's focus was on industrial workers of the world members and on increasing food production on the home front. And over the course of 1917, members of the State Council of Defense here in Montana clamored for more authority. And so in February of 1918, Governor Stewart pushed through legislation giving the Council of Defense formal and wide-ranging powers. With their official charge to, quote, perform all acts and things necessary or proper so that the military, civil, and industrial resources of the state may be most efficiently applied toward maintenance of the defense of the state, end quote, the council began organizing at the local level across Montana. Newly empowered county-level council members used their unchecked authority to settle local scores. Over 130 Montanans, mostly from the agrarian eastern part of the state, landed in jail on sedition charges. Meantime, Will Campbell, 
the rabidly anti-union editor of the Helena Independent, joined the State Council of Defense. He also emerged as the primary opponent of the Nonpartisan League in Montana. Campbell created and then directed an organization called the Montana Loyalty League, which even published a newspaper, the Montana Loyalist, which was an anti-NPL sheet. And Campbell used both the Independent and the Montana Loyalist to viciously attack the Nonpartisan League, calling its leader Arthur Townley, quote, surrounded by a gang of socialist soapboxers, end quote. Soon, the Montana Loyalty League and the State Council of Defense started working together to squash NPL organizing across the state. The loyalty committee that grabbed NPL organizer J.A. Mickey McGlynn in Miles City in April of 1918 locked him in the basement of the Elks Club before putting him on a train out of town. On that same trip, businessmen refused McGlynn the use of a hall in Terry, even after McGlynn drafted affidavits attesting to his Red Cross donations and war bond purchases, showing that he was supporting the nation in a time of war. A few weeks later, outside of Mizpah, ranchers seized the long-suffering McGlynn, intending to use a rope to drag him down a nearby creek bed. He narrowly escaped. Soon thereafter, a vigilante group calling themselves the Muscle Shell Hundred seized two other league organizers, beating them badly. In at least one case, a league worker met an even worse fate. Daniel McCorkle, a Presbyterian minister in Conrad, organized for the NPL. And like others, he himself faced physical assault. But in 1922, in correspondence that's right here in the archives, he wrote a friend about a fellow NPL booster who disappeared during an earlier campaign. Learning that his colleague landed in the Montana State Hospital for the Insane, McCorkle, in retrospect, held suspicions about how he got there. He remembered that some neighbors threatened to put his friend, quote, in the asylum as crazy, end quote. And though he thought nothing of it at the time, McCorkle came to believe that the booster, quote, was put in the asylum to counteract his influence in favor of the league and to get him out of the way, end quote. In Montana, this wartime repression that the league faced pushed laborers across the state and farmers to start working together. The nascent affinity of Montana's equity cooperative organizers and the labor unions here in Montana, that affinity blossomed in the context of state-sanctioned suppression. During the 1917 copper miners' strike in Butte, League farmers invited union ally and U.S. House member Jeanette Rankin to speak to them about the unrest. She applauded the farmer's decision to learn more about the struggles of industrial laborers, telling them that, quote, you have gone a step farther than any farmers in the past, end quote. Rankin thanked them. She thanked them for realizing, quote, that the handicaps that confront the producer, whether on the farm or in the mine, are very closely related, end quote. She further assured the worried agrarians that, quote, out of the 15,000 strikers, not more than 300, end quote, carried IWW cards. In other words, the wobbly, wary farmers were assured that miners could, in fact, be trusted. When the 1917 strike in Butte failed, private agents masquerading as wobblies organized another brief but violent strike in Butte in September of 1918. The second walkout brought out the heavy hand of law enforcement, and it cracked down on labor organizers there. It shattered the union movement in Butte. Desperate for new directions in organizing, Butte's labor leaders, in the wake of the September 1918 strike, became intrigued with the NPL's nonpartisan model for electoral politics. They established connections with excited league leaders at the new Montana headquarters in Great Falls. And copying the NPL's nonpartisan approach, Butte's labor leaders soon formed the Nonpartisan Club of Silver Bow County, headquartered, of course, in Butte. Preparing for the 1918 contest, the nonpartisan club there ran candidates in the Democratic Party. One of them, the controversial editor of the Butte Bulletin, William Dunn, won his primary contest to run for the state legislature from that city. And he, of course, he won in the general election that year. That victory allowed Dunn to support farmers' initiatives during his term in Helena. That same election season, the farmers and laborers 
together then also endorsed Jeanette Rankin's run for the US Senate seat from Montana. And though she lost the election, her campaign further fostered a firm farmer labor alliance emerging here in Montana. Now, the 1918 election season gave other reasons for the nearly 20,000 leaguers here in Montana to celebrate. None of the statewide offices had come up. And so in the August 1918 primary, the NPL endorsed candidates for the legislature in both parties. The league endorsement carried 14 into the general election for the state Senate, and they garnered 28 endorsed nominees to stand in the general election for the House. The effort to be thoroughly nonpartisan, however, meant that the NPL did not capture a single party's machinery. Nonetheless, it didn't work out the way they hoped. With the help of what one leaguer called, quote, the worst blizzard in the history of the state, end quote, entrenched politicians won in the November 1918 general elections. Only three leaguers found their way to the state Senate here in Helena. 16 league-endorsed candidates made it into the House. And one NPL-endorsed judge made it onto the Montana Supreme Court. What's interesting is that in the wake of this kind of turn against the league in November of 1918, is that that's the very moment in which Democrats and Republicans alike here in Montana start working to undercut the NPL. They clearly feared it. During the spring 1919 legislative session, Democrats and Republicans came together to eliminate the open primary for state offices and to reinstate the convention system for all party nominations. The League responded by marshalling a massive petition effort to refer the new law to the people of the state. NPL organizers used posters, picnics, and red, white, and blue automobile stickers with this slogan, Save the Primary, to reach beyond the League's membership for support. Emphasizing the need to preserve a more democratic election process, the NPL drew in labor unions and peeled off reform-minded progressives from both parties that otherwise distrusted the League. All of them together recognized that the proposed change in election law represented what one nonpartisan leader called, quote, the death of popular government in Montana, end quote. Turning out large numbers of petitioners, the nonpartisan League succeeded in putting the new primary laws on the 1920 election ballot. Now, politicians here in Helena could not be stopped. They countered the League's effort to do so by calling a special session of the state legislature in September of 1919. Under the public guise of offering relief to drought-stricken farmers, they again approved a closed primary that forced voters to use a straight party ticket. And to ensure their success, they declared the law petition-proof through the unprecedented invocation of a statewide emergency allowed for by the state constitution. Now, eventually, courts overturned that latter injunction. And in November of 1920, voters affirmed the earlier, more open primary laws in Montana. And the primary law was preserved here. In that 1920 election, Leaguers also launched a new career. And I want to stop here for a second and talk about what the League looks like in Montana in 1920, because you start to see that they are becoming a force. It's not just about eastern Montana anymore. Um, what I have here are some membership maps. Um, they basically haven't been seen for decades. And there was no key in this membership map. And what I did is I broke up the state of Montana. So we're going to look at different parts of the state to see where Leaguers were in 1920. You'll see that there are these hash marks, there's no key. So I don't know if a hash mark means one member or a group of five or a group of 10. I have no idea. Nonetheless, this spatial representation created by somebody in the National Nonpartisan League's office in St. Paul um, gives us some sense of at least where leaguers were in the state in 1920. So we see them here in Fallon County, Prairie County, Dawson, and then, of course, right up here in northeastern Montana kind of where you would expect them if you know anything about the state's history. Now, how about the High Line? I know this, they, don't, they didn't reproduce very well, but you see here these pockets of leaguers all through the High Line counties, which makes sense given the railroad's presence and the fact this is a grain-growing region. So this is what you might expect 
if you know anything about Montana history. But this is where things start to get interesting. Look at around Billings, here in the Yellowstone Valley, in the Muscle Shell, and Fergus counties. The league is no longer just for farmers in the eastern part of the state. Gallatin Valley, this is really striking. Look at this, right around Bozeman. A big cluster, and also into Park County. So the league is clearly spreading into these different parts of Montana in 1920, and that's what makes it such a major player in the 1920 election. In western Montana, sorry about Lewis and Clark County. Um, <laughs> the facts are the facts, right? The evidence is the evidence. But look it up here by Kalispell. There's a pocket, and there's a pocket in Missoula County. So the league has spread into these other parts of the state. Um, not only had it spread into these other parts of the state, but it also had endorsed Burton K. Wheeler, a Butte-based lawyer and former U.S. District Attorney, who beat out the incumbent lieutenant governor for the right to run at the top of the Democratic ticket, that is, to run for governor of the state of Montana. This is Wheeler, of course, three years later. Um, I just love this picture of him, and that's why I didn't include a, a, a younger version. He just seems so happy there. And happy is not something we always think of with Burton Wheeler. Um, the League, of course, was calling for state-owned industries, and, of course, it directly challenged the Anaconda Company. It's one of the reasons Wheeler was attracted to the League. And, of course, the fact that the League had spread to all these different parts of the state helped ensure that the League seized control of the Democratic Party here in Montana. And despite the efforts of party politicians to stymie the League here, the League looked more primed for victory than ever as people looked forward to November 1920. But Wheeler came up short that year. Former U.S. Senator Joseph Dixon co-opted the NPL's anti-anaconda stance, even as he carefully allied himself with angry Democrats across Montana angry Democrats who couldn't believe that their party had been hijacked by insurgents. And during an incident in Dillon, Wheeler remembered being forced to speak at a ranch outside of town after the town fathers had banned any political meetings not approved by either local Republican or local Democratic Party officials. Before he could begin, Wheeler remembered seeing, quote, a phalanx of men, apparently white-collared professional fellows, end quote, approach and cry, quote, get a rope, end quote. Retreating to a boxcar on a nearby railroad siding, just north of town, Wheeler and a sympathetic farmhand faced down yet another mob. Wheeler remembered that, quote, when the posse drove up and started to open the door of the boxcar, my protector cocked his gun and called out, I'll shoot anyone full of lead who opens this door, end quote. The crowd parted. As word of the incident spread, however, opposition newspapermen ridiculed Wheeler. They referred to him as Boxcar Burt. And though he lost in the 1920 election in his venture to become the state's governor, he tried for the U.S. Senate seat in 1922 on that same Democratic ticket, and of course, he won. Now, the electoral failures of 1920 largely undid the NPL in Montana. In combination with terrible drought in the eastern part of the state, that drove farmers out of farming, it greatly weakened the League insurgency here. In 1922, the League served as little more than a body that endorsed candidates in the Democratic Party. It had kind of dissipated as a force. Of course, a tiny remnant soldiered on as an explicitly farmer-labor coalition sympathetic to the newborn Communist Party centered in Plentywood. But even after the League passed from the scene in Montana, farmers found themselves transformed through their involvement in this movement. The League's discourse displayed words and images that slowly transformed the ways farmers thought about themselves. Though it hoped only to initially capitalize on and reinforce agrarian sensibilities, the NPL fostered a new capacity for civic agency in rural precincts by changing farmers' perceptions of what was possible. One agrarian in North Dakota put it this way, quote, Farmers have been negligent about being in office. 
they woke up to the simple fact that they had to get out and take part in government, unquote. Solving the problems they faced in common demanded participation in cooperative public work. It is with a similar commitment to cooperative public work that I wrote this book. Insurgent democracy tries to relate the past to the present forcefully, in a way that might even trouble other colleagues in the profession. Now, of course, as I was writing the book, I not only engaged in careful primary source research in eight states and two Canadian provinces, but I also read democratic theory and important strains of what might be called the populist tradition of social criticism from great, if controversial, minds such as Christopher Lash. The questions I asked of the past grew from my discontent with the status quo in the American political and public present. And despite the book's decidedly scholarly apparatus, I was anxious to be as accessible as possible. So it's not an accident that the first line in the book is, quote, this book means to make you think differently about politics, unquote. So even though the book is about dead white farmers, not exactly the sexiest subject in the humanities and social sciences right now, I wrote the book to engage a broader public in conversations about how they might reimagine themselves as citizens, about how they might reimagine democracy, not as voting every two or every four years, but instead, as the philosopher John Dewey put it in 1913, 1939, excuse me, democracy as a way of life. I wrote it to spark conversations about how we need to expand our understanding of electoral politics so that it can transcend parties and an ever more narrowly defined ideological spectrum. Instead, have us focus on working across differences around shared self-interest. I wrote it to spark conversations about our need to find usable pasts, pasts that hold out the possibility of reshaping our collective future. I might fail in these heady tasks, but the important thing for all historians, I think, is to try. And that's what really matters. Thanks very much. <laughs>